spot though that's what i need to figure out all right so let's count this down in five four three two one Let's go, everybody. What's up? It looks like we are live. It looks like we are streaming to the uh, actual event page. So that's nice. It worked as expected. Uh, what's going on, everybody? Super excited to have you all here. Uh, thank you for today's session is brought to you and sponsored by the Generative AI World Summit, which is taking place at the MLOps World Summit in Austin, Texas from October 25th through October 26th. And it also has a virtual component. The session theme for today is the future of generative AI vision and challenges. This panel is going to explore the potential of generative AI in reshaping industries, its future trajectory, and its challenges. The panelists here today will discuss the advancements they foresee in the next decade and the hurdles that we must overcome in that time. Again, thank you to the MLOps World Summit and the Generative AI World Summit for sponsoring the event. You can register for the conference with the discount code HARPREET, all lowercase, for $75 off your ticket price. If you're watching this on the live stream, whether YouTube or on uh, LinkedIn, you can drop your questions right there in the chat. I'll be monitoring the uh, chat section for any questions. And then I'll also uh, drop a link very shortly to Slido where you can anonymously ask questions. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists, starting with Miriam Eric. Miriam is a recovering physicist and co-founder and CEO of Titan ML, where she's helping businesses navigate the LLM deployment minefield. Titan ML is a NLP D a uh, development platform that focuses on the deployability of large language models, allowing businesses to build smaller and cheaper language model deployments easily. Miriam, thank you so much for being part of this session. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be uh, on a panel of some of my favorite linked influencers. So it looks I, like uh, Miriam might be some issue with the with the audio there. So you might want to check. I wasn't able to hear anything. What about now? Um, but we we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, feel free to interrupt. If it's just me, let me know in the uh, chat here in the Zoom room if you're able to hear her or if it was just, just me. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our next panelist. We have Christoph Chabert. Christoph is a trained bioinformatician scientist with a focus on sequencing data. And he's currently the service and product manager for MLOps at Roche. He's now utilizing machine learning, data integration, and cloud technologies to accelerate drug discovery. Christoph, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you uh, joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here to discuss this very exciting topic. So great to, to meet you all. And I feel like it might be my audio that is messed up. So I'll go ahead and uh, check that out in a, in a second. Um, Let's go ahead and introduce our next panelist is uh, Niels Bantelon. Niels is the chief ML engineer at Union AI, where he's building open source software to make data and machine learning practitioners more productive. You may also recognize him as the creator of Pandor, Pandera and the open source maintainer of Flight. Thank you so much for being here, Niels. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Super excited to join all the cool people here. So I'm just going to sort out these technical difficulties. I have no clue what's going on, how all of a sudden um, my video. This is what happens when you have two professionals set up. There we go. It started working. All, all I had to do was, uh, all I had to do was plug it in. That's, uh, that's all it was. Um, yeah. So apologies for this, uh, everyone. So let's. Go ahead and get right back to it. Uh, hopefully everybody that was watching can hear those uh, uh, hellos and thank yous, but I'll, I'll edit everything out. Anyways, on to our next panelist. Uh, we've got Rajiv Shah. Rajiv has over 10 years of experience in data science, uh, working across industries such as uh, insurance and even um, heavy manufacturing uh, at companies like State Farm, Caterpillar, Data Robot. And he's currently an ML engineer at Hugging Face, where he's on the go-to-market and sales team, sharing his experience with enterprises. Rajiv, thank you so much for being here. Ah, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. 
Next up, we have Sandeep Singh. Sandeep is a hands-on technical leader with a unique ability to help engineers and researchers optimize their targets while avoiding blind spots. Uh, he's been a mentor at Deep Learning AI and a teaching assistant for Full Stack Deep Learning. Uh, and he's currently the head of Applied AI and Computer Vision at Beans.ai, where he's building end-to-end -end solutions for scalable computer vision on massive satellite image data. Thank you so much for being here, Sandeep. Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have a discussion with panelists here. It's same here. I'm excited to have all you guys here. And again, if anybody has questions, a couple of ways you could do it. You could drop them right here into the chat or you can drop them in Slido. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, start with the, with an easy question. <laughs> How about that? So uh, language models have been around for, for a few years, right? But they really changed our lives uh, in less than a year. I can't really imagine... Uh, life without a language model anymore, without being able to interact with the language model uh, ever since the release of, of you know, ChatGPT. Um, but I'm wondering, how do you see the evolution of language models um, over the next five years? Um, let's start with uh, Rajiv, and then we'll go to uh, Niels. And if any other panelist wants to participate in the question, just use the raise hand icon and I'll call on you next. But let's hear from Rajiv first. Yeah, I mean, it, the next five years, it's always so hard to predict. But if we look back like five years ago, like this is when Google was just coming out with BERT, which seems like a toy model at this point, right? Like it's like a hundred million parameters, right? Compared to like the billions we have, or maybe even trillions with the GPT-4 and just right seeing all the different uses that we've had and just how flexible we are with language. Right? Now we're seeing multimodal large language models. And you know, five years from now, we're going to have those things working on our phones in our pockets like that, where retrieving information, generating information, all of that stuff is just going to become so easy to do. We'll have to talk about how well they'll reason, but I think access to information is just going to be immensely changed. So, yeah. Let's hear from uh, from Niels now. Yeah, I think it's uh, just to add to that, there's this interesting world where we tokenize everything, right? It's not just characters or language, spoken language. You can tokenize audio, you can to tokenize images, you can to tokenize video, you can tokenize brain signals, you can tokenize, and transformers are turning out to be a really nice API for fusing different modalities. And we've, I think the ML space has been seeking such an architecture and transformers is probably not the last, the kind of final architecture for this, but it's turning out to be a very powerful fusion kind of modality or architecture for combining different things together, putting them into a common embedding space. And then the, the set of problems becomes like, how do you correlate these data? How do you combine the data sets in meaningful semantic aligning various things together in a way that we can just like let loose a training uh, uh, setting on, onto these data um, and do, doing really interesting things with them. Let's turn it over to, uh, to, to Miriam now. Yeah, I completely agree with both of your guys' points. Uh, additional things that I'm really excited for over the next five years, I think we'll see uh, language models having a huge, huge impact in both biology and material sciences. And I think we'll see very, very large and rapid increases in, in what we're able to do as a species because of that. Um, secondarily, I think as an enterprise and as a businesses, I, as a business, I think we will have AI and LLMs embedded in almost every single workflow that we do in a way that in five years, it will just feel normal. And I think we'll see hundreds, if not thousands of uh, AI systems in every single business, which I'm also very excited by. I'm curious from your perspective, uh, Miriam, having you know, working with, with uh, enterprises to deploy these solutions, um, uh, how do you see deployment changing? Let's, let's not say the next five years, but let's say, you know, in the next six months or so. Yeah, I think deployment is going to change. So right now, people are struggling with just getting access to GPUs and are just getting like struggling with just fitting whatever language model they have on, on whatever um, hardware they have in the latency they require. They're the pro problems that we're solving at the moment. However, in the next probably six or 12 months is too soon. But over the next couple of years, I think we'll really start 
uh, looking at solving scaling problems. So how can we really, really efficiently scale these models? Um, maybe doing multi-GPU inference um, with the very large language models, but also doing multi-model inference. So how can we have like hundreds of models on a single GPU? Um, when, you know, when we think that businesses will start having personalized models for each of their accounts, for each of their brands, for example, you might want to fit 100 models uh, on a single GPU. And I think there's some really interesting deployment uh, problems that will be involved there. So right now we're focusing on the simple stuff, making, you know, helping businesses get it cheaper and faster on smaller GPUs and, and CPUs. And over the long term, we'll see some very, very complex and scaled deployments, which we're, we're already preparing for um, now. Awesome. Thank you, Miriam. And I'm wondering, Rajiv, um, like, you know, having worked at, uh, currently at, at Hugging Face, where you're helping enterprises, you know, do this stuff in, in production, um, do you see any kind of, um, let's say, uh, I don't want to say anti-patterns, but <laughs> do you, are you seeing any types of uh, anti-patterns when it comes to to deploying um, uh, language models and productions at the moment? Yeah, I, it's a huge topic, but I want to actually go back to one thing Miriam said about how all of this stuff is going to get weaved together. Because I think that's an interesting piece where right now when we think about like using AI, it's often we think about like one chunk of AI, one chunk of humans like that. And I think just if you think about the internet and just how interweaven that is in the workflows today, where we don't think about when we use the internet or when we don't use the internet, I think, you know, the AI is going to become like that. And of course, it takes a while to think like that. And I so I you see how, for example, people that have somewhat grown up with ChatGPT interweave that into their into their how they work, right? That latest AI productivity study kind of pointed out these different workflows. And so I think that's going to be one of those things that we'll start to see as those interweave and work um, ways to kind of work with AI and language models. Indeed, uh, let's hear from you. Yeah, in regards to what just now Rajiv said, what will happen in future, which I imagine won't be like very long future. Um, we will have like models uh, which are expected to have multi-model by default. There won't be any model which is unimodal just for image or text. In fact, all models are supposed to uh, have all modalities as a single um, vortex of information. And, and that will become a default. So term multi-model over the course of years will thin out and the model itself will replace the term multi-model as we use uh, in today's world. Um, in fact, just uh, 30 seconds before I joined this meeting, I saw a demo. Um, at, I'm currently at the Google's uh, Mountain View office and it exactly what is happening already in all of the Google Workspace uh, products. Um, for example, same model they refer to talk to images, text, audio, and in fact, the same query response with two contents of image as well as the text and the audio as well. So I think multi-model is going to be pretty short-lived and the model itself will be considered multi-model by default in the near future. And this next question I have asked you has to do with, you know, kind of the 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 role of generative AI at large, really shaping our interaction with technology in the coming years. You know, the Rajiv mentioned that, you know, the, the internet has changed the way we interact with technology. And, and no doubt uh, these types of uh, generative AI models are going to change that as well. Um, Sandeep, let's, let's hear from you, you know, considering what you just saw right before joining the call, <laughs> how do you see uh, this interaction between humans yeah, and generative so, AI playing out? So, yeah, sure. So what is happening at the moment, we saw 2017 and 18 when computer vision's aha moment happened and AI started making um, waves. And since January, 2021, after clip paper till now, this whole year, we are seeing a lot of generative AI, which refers to uh, LLM, and partially it refers to text-to-image based stable diffusion sort of technologies. But what I predict, and I, I feel very confident in saying that, is that very soon we will have the new poster child of AI, the way we have chatbots as a most exciting thing at the moment, 
um, the way we had imagined in 2017, we'll have a multi-modal um, usage. For example, the usage where you will seamlessly interact with text uh, to image to audio. What I mean to say, um, like same model will have capacity to decide which modality to use to respond to your question, uh, either to show an image or to show an audio um, and to show some other form of uh, hybrid content. And that, that new poster child will be at the cross ju uh, junction of image as well as text, as well as the audio. And that's what I imagine because generative AI is currently it's being overused. And everybody, when you use the term generative AI, they imagine chatbots. But basically, generative AI is brewing much deeper storm, uh, which will change the way we um, use entertainment products. We do enterprise work, um, especially like a lot of fundamental companies like Sony, Honda, Panasonic. Um, these companies are fusing so much amount of uh, multi-model generative AI in our products. We are going to have like washing machine, which will do something with the generative AI. For example, you'll be able to talk to it and um, you will give command, which is very much um, actu will actuators and all. And I see that will be the next poster child into, in the field of generative AI, where you see like agents using um, fused instruction and fused responses. That'd be interesting to have a, a washing machine with generative AI. It's just like tossed in all my laundry and it just picks like outfits for me and makes me <laughs> fashionable all of a sudden. C combination that I wouldn't have thought of. Uh, Niels, let's, let's hear from you on this topic. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you envision the role of generative AI kind of shaping our interaction with technology? Yeah, maybe. So th there's the creative piece to this, right? We'll, we'll have tools to generate images, generate music, uh, change our accents, speak different languages, uh, even without knowing them. Um, maybe like a slightly darker side of this uh, that I maybe want to highlight is that we, we already don't believe what we see on the internet to some extent. Like we see an image and you can see that it's photoshopped, um, but maybe you can be fooled sometimes. And some people buy it, but you know, uh, maybe I'm speaking for myself here, and, and maybe many of you, uh, you, you don't buy it immediately, and you need further proof. You need some receipts. You need uh, references, and this will bleed into text that we read, um, media types, all the media types that we, that we consume. As long as it's out, as long as as it's within the creative space. Uh, a painting doesn't need, per se, like a ver verification, per se. Like maybe you'd want to know what the prompt was or who produced it or what data points it used to kind of like interpolate or extrapolate like this beautiful image. But when we're in a different mode, when we're information gathering and truth seeking, I think this will fundamentally change the way we interact with the internet. And the bar will be higher um, in certain modes of information seeking that uh, it'll just be a 10 or 100x. You you will need to be 10 or 100x more skeptical and more uh, uh, ask for references and citations. And maybe that won't be everyone, but I think that will be one of the dynamics that will occur. Miriam, let's hear from you. Yeah, I'm, I'm hugely concerned by this, amongst other things. But I think it's very easy to say that we need to be more skeptical on the internet, but we're people in AI and it takes a really long time for uh, the general public to, to really understand technology. Like it took a long time for my mom to understand Facebook, for example. And we are going to see multiple election cycles where there are big swathes of the population who don't really understand generative AI, don't really understand uh, the limitations around it and what they might be seeing, whether it's fake or real. And I, so, and as a result, we need to think, okay, what can platforms be doing to help this? 
what can we be doing from a technology layer to you know watermark these if possible um and then what can regulators and election boards be doing um to to stop the, the spread of uh, mis and disinformation because it's very all very well and good saying we need to be more skeptical but how do you tell that to my grandma um and her vote is worth the same as mine so that that's hugely concerning for me let's go to uh christoph on this i guess you know we talked about how how uh Generative AI at large is shaping interaction with uh, with technology, but what about um, the relationship between humans and AI actually uh, evolving over the coming years? Uh, let's go to Christoph, then uh, Rajiv, and then also uh, Sandeep. After that, Christoph, let's hear from you. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So I think I think we touched on that already, right? So AI is going to be everywhere. I think it is very clear now with the the way these technologies are transformative and pervasive, in you know already in everyday life right so that's going to accelerate and continue to do that so i think we're going to have a, a lot more information consumption generation i think we've mentioned that already at work in private lives etc right what i think is very exciting about generative ai is that there really is also this creative component associated with it right so um, we're really seeing now a lot of people really trying to play with the different modalities right with you know models that carry very well certain tasks and so on uh, we think that in the future that might be un unified in one simple model, but I think this sort of creative aspect now I think is very revolutionary because you're going to have also some input from the AI itself that can you know allow you to think a little bit differently and to to come up with some patterns and so on. And I think that's very exciting and that's very differentiating compared to what we've seen in the past. Christoph, in in your work, you're, you're using you know machine learning for uh, the acceleration of drug discovery. Um, so yeah. we touched on like the the creative aspect of it, but um, you know, how does this uh, interplay with with research kind of aspect, or is research creative? I mean, uh, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Yeah. So what we're seeing now, there's already you know publications right coming from many different uh, places that are showing that when using generative AI as opposed to what I would call more traditional, right? I think traditional, like a year ago, you know, approaches, we're starting to see some patterns emerging. So we're able to formulate new hypotheses, right? That uh, we can then test in the laboratory. And that's very exciting, right? Because this just means that we're just gonna have so many more options when we're doing drug discovery. So we might not only accelerate, but also explore an even wider space of options and therapeutic options, et cetera. And that's just one aspect, right? There's a whole healthcare industry that's gonna be transformed. And I think this is, again, really exciting. And that has so much potential for the future that, you know, we should, you know, keep experimenting, keep checking, you know, what's happening. Christoph, thank you. Uh, let's go to Rajiv. And after Rajiv, we'll head to uh, Sandeep. Yeah, I, I always enjoy talking about the benefits of AI and kind of all the scary parts. Um, and I think the creative was one piece, you know, one segment of that that I really have been following lately is how we can use AI as a coach. So lots of times, right, the normal reflection is like, hey, this, this chat GPT is just a tool to get my homework done. I'm just going to use it to get my answer. But that tool can easily be kind of rewired to be a coach that makes you think carefully about what you're doing and not give you the answer, but teach you what are the building blocks to think about? What are the steps to actually solve a problem? And so that's one of the things I'm excited is, is how we can use that to kind of where people want to, to help them build their better, build skills even better and learn areas even deeper. So there's an interesting uh, point. I was listening to this audiobook AI 2041, um, and one of, it's like 10 different uh, kind of standalone stories about, you know, the natural progression of AI and how it'll play out. And one of the chapters there was describing exactly what you're talking about there, like a, uh, AI kind of mentor, student aid to personalize education. I think that's an exciting prospect. Yeah, uh, for sure. like if you look at Khan Academy's building apps like this, Duolingo has built this into their apps. It's not that hard to kind of start doing these things. And I think we'll see more and more of this. Sandeep, let's hear from you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I would just like to add something to what Miriam said. Uh, so what is happening, this whole AI movement at the moment, it is like another Gutenberg project happening, which happened in history because initially people thought only religious leaders or uh, elites have to learn to read and write and why common people have to learn to read and write. And, 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 and now we know everybody should uh, know uh, 
uh, how to read and write. And that's very uh, seminally useful. So what is happening at the moment? Not everybody thinks that everybody in society needs to know something about AI. But this is fundamentally flawed. What is happening? So at the center of whole of the AI um, Big Bang happening, we know it's it's something called universal approximation theorem, where it says anything can be mapped to any uh, thing, which means any imaginary function can be created with help of these technologies. So what does it mean for a society, especially if you see in the domain of text to image, people still, you know, many in many jurisdictions still images text videos and audios what is available online is used as a proof in their justice system but as raji was saying and we know that any of the data which you can create using sensors like camera data or audio data or text data online it can very well be created by these machines, which are, for most of the general cases, they are as good as humans. So, but the society doesn't realize this gravity here. And, and so what happens if you see some image which is um, objectionable in some manner, people, I would say like if you survey thousand people and show the image to them, maybe probably two or three will say, it might be generated image. It's too absurd to be real images. So society has to do a catch up here and, and people like you and me who are engaged and doing the work in this domain, they have a fundamental responsibility to bring people on board. For example, as Miriam was saying, uh, her mother took the time to understand the how Facebook uh, is embedded in our life. Similarly, AI will be much more disruptive and it is going to be much faster, much more disruptive. So, for example, the chatbots which are deploying, being deployed for the kids, especially the Khan Academy or the Udacity, if you go there very easily, you can really uh, bypass all the safety mechanisms and start talking something which it should not be talking. And, and if you know how to do the prompt injection, you can do that. But what I'm trying to say, every single critical domain where we are deploying these so powerful technologies, we have to educate the whole diaspora, not just the few people who are using it. For example, a driver who drives a bus, he should be educated about the dangers of AI. For example, if he apply, if anybody applies to a job, it flat out gets rejected um, because of some model did not uh, recommend that it's a good candidate or suitable for it. So, and the damages of these hyperscale models are already happening in society. For example, concert ticket, who different people will say different availability of different seats, depending on what model decide who has higher propensity to buy the ticket. Um, and that's in a manner, it's not fair because you might be buying ticket for your son's 10th birthday for a particular concert, but model decides you are not going to spend the money, you don't see the availability. So all these nano disadvantages of AI technologies are already hampering the society. It's, it's a very urgent need that we educate whole society and humanity as what is going to come or what is already here. Um, and, and we have to change how fundamentally we work. But I would say the danger here is at the amazing massive scale. And we have to really treat it with urgency. We don't have time to see how it pans out. Uh, experts and um, government authorities, regulatory bodies have to step up their game and do the catch up with these technologies. Mary, uh, let's let's hear from you. What I've been increasingly convinced by uh, working with enterprises is actually, even though the models are inherently like very unpredictable and sometimes quite dangerous, actually there's a huge amount of power in architecting really great systems around the models. So, you know, building things in like human in the loop, building in RAG, uh, building in all of these kinds of, kind of traditional software systems around it uh, that mean that your system as a whole is safe, even if the model in isolation uh, might not be. And I think 
as we're building all of the, our applications, we need to be thinking, how can we build them in a safe way, even though you might not be able to have control over the model itself, but can you architect it in a way? Can you put safeguards in place? Can you age restrict it? All of these uh, things around the model, I think will, will be incredibly important for safety, not just the model itself. With respect to deployment, I guess, did what considerations do we need to make then with you know deployment plus plus safety or are these two kind of things that we don't you know put in the same bucket of curious your perspective on that yeah i i think it's got to do with like how you architect your system so and you can deploy that you know in, in any way you want but if you're building a system that uh, communicates with customers directly then it's a really risky system like uh, they you know, it can say anything uh, to your customer. But if actually what you're building is something that, you know, provides a first draft for a customer service rep, then you're building in inherent safety checks along the way. You know, you're putting a human in the loop, you're holding someone accountable. Um, another example is, uh, let's say you're building a model that will give out information. Uh, how can you build it such that the uh, the model doesn't say anything that's not in its data set, that's not in its RAG um, vector database. And you can do these kinds of architectural things around the model itself. Um, so when it ends up in deployment and ends up in users' hands, it is a really safe system. Um, so these are all, all the kinds of things that we see a lot of enterprises on because they're applications. Thank you. And thank you for the, uh, really appreciate that. I'd love to hear on this. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, difficulties with kind of adopting and deploying uh, large language modeling, what your perspective is on that. And then uh, after this, I got a question coming in from uh, one of our audience members, SWAT team. We'll jump to her question. Uh, Christelle, to you. Yeah. Yes. So I think deployment, and I would say in general, computational cost, right? And and, and all that, uh, that it entails, right? Is still really, from my perspective, a limitation. So I think there's been a lot of progress. Um, you can access a whole lot of different models. There's a lot of work that's been done, especially with cloud providers and, and others. Uh, but I, I do believe that we still need to go one step forward if we really want to be able to fully democratize this technology uh, in the way that a lot of people are envisioning it to be the case in a few years, right? Uh, so I think, um, Maryam, you talked a little bit about that, right? And I think you're you're doing a, a lot of work in that front. And I think it's incredibly important because um, it's going to also empower more and more people to actually start, you know, building some solutions using, you know, these this sort of uh, Lego elements, right? So uh, this is really important because we're going to see, again, the creativity kicking in and a lot of things that are going to be very exciting going to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, just kind of a random thought. I'm wondering if there should be a trend now instead of moving to bigger and bigger models, like to move to smaller models that could you know, fit on deployment devices and, and infer fast and maybe think of smarter ways to, um, to, to uh, architect more small models that that have that same capacity as large ones uh Miriam, yes what do you no i was just gonna say i bet rajiv has some good things to say because <laughs> i shared a couple of his videos on this exact topic oh well, and i think this is uh, oh, yeah. okay no, no no go for it Rajiv. Yes, uh, right, uh, this is a classic part of whenever we th we're talking about data science is we always want to pick the best tool for the job it's get easy to get seduced with the latest innovations and technology and just focus on them but right you always don't need kind of a huge sledgehammer kind of to take out a fly, right? And picking it. And what we've learned in, right, if you look at the research around large language models versus using smaller specialized models that often for many use cases, a smaller specialized model that's especially narrowly focused when we start talking about all the generative pieces like this um, can do much better performance in terms of accuracy, in terms of compute costs in many different dimensions like that. Let's go to uh, Christoph and then over to Sandeep. Christoph, go for it. Yeah, this this is this is a very interesting discussion, and we've had many over the past uh, weeks and months. Um, I would say my my personal take on this is that it's important to experiment and see what works, especially I think in an enterprise context, right? I think uh, you know it's it's very it, you can talk about it for hours, right? But it, until you actually try it and you put your users in front of the tool and they tell you what's really happening and they, they share that with you and you observe that, I think it's very hard to know. So I think experimentation is key, right? Sometimes it will work with something smaller, sometimes it won't. And I think that's still okay. Technology evolves very fast, so yeah. Indeed, let's hear from you. Yeah, um, so as, um, 
everybody said that, yeah, of course, you have to experiment and do the evaluation of your ROI, whether it makes sense for you or not. Uh, but what I'm seeing, the ecosystem, how it's being built for various tooling components, uh, inter dependence on specific set of hardwares is going to go down. For example, currently, you cannot possibly think of building software other than uh, on top of uh, NVIDIA ecosystem or uh, TPUs for that matter. But in future, future, we will definitely have more specialized and commodity hardwares available. Um, and many different companies are working like Graphcore, they have IPOs. And, and in fact, I, I cannot count the number of companies where I see the specific hardwares and all of them are for doing some sort of back propagation maths uh, for uh, training these models. So, uh, so one part is that hardware ecosystem will be much better. So your ROI will uh, get better and you don't have to really only rely on bigger cloud providers. Uh, but other things, what will happen, the mathematics, the innovative piece, which is very much happening at this moment, it will figure out a way to do things efficiently. For example, every single thing is, uh, which is beyond mammoth uh, um, resources needed, for example, LLMs. Um, we know there are much better techniques to fine tune them, uh, especially the L LoRa and QL LoRa and so on. Um, I imagine that uh, the innovation will drive the total cost of running and deploying these things much lower. Um, and it will happen not just by the software and libraries, it will also happen from the hardware providers. Um, so, but, but we know as a matter of fact, right at this moment to do anything very significant, we are at the mercy of cloud providers because you possibly can't buy 500 A100 GPUs. You only have to um, pay to Azure or AWS or uh, GCP. Um, so I, I think we are in tough state as of now, but it'll get better definitely in future. So my wife wanted to buy two A100s and uh, she was like, you realize our 10 year anniversary is coming up and I need an yes. updated ring. So yes. choose wisely. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Niels. And then after Niels, I promise Swati will get to your question. Uh, Swati's got a question about the future of knowledge graphs versus LLMs. So keep that in the back of your head panelists. If anybody wants to participate on that question. Uh, Niels, let's hear from you. Yeah, yeah, just to add to this conversation, I'm I'm just so curious what the tools will be like moving forward to essentially treat models like software, right? Like you have your base model, you have a bunch of LoRa adapters, maybe, maybe something else, right? You have your dependency, which is the base model, you have some other dependencies. And to treat these models, uh, uh, I guess, looking at you, Rajiv, working on in Hugging Face, just like working on the stack to minify models, to prune them, to like make them a lot lighter weight and have less environmental impact, make them cheaper, um, but with the same accuracy. So I, I think there's just like a huge space for development there, um, looking into uh, specialized models that fit on a toaster, you know? Yeah, I think Carpathy, in fact, blogged something about that today, right? The having large language models as the OS like that. And right, and we've seen this to some extent with deep learning and how we had to, you know, there's still a lot of value for feature engineering, but there's also a lot of feature engineering that's done in these models. And we've kind of put that away. And you're right, kind of these next set of models is going to take away more of those tasks to kind of give us, you know, that much more streamlined interface um, like that. So yeah, no, it's it's moving towards that way. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, let's get to the question here from, from Swati. Um, and this is about the future of knowledge graphs versus uh, large language models. Um, would anybody want to uh, chime in on, on this question? Um, yes, Sandeep, if you, and if you can maybe give us like a quick primer on, on you know what exactly a knowledge graph is, because um, some folks might not be uh, too familiar with that. Yeah, sure. Um, so knowledge graph is nothing but the graphical representation of uh, uh, any type of knowledge. Uh, when I say graphical, not the graphics, it's a graph based uh, data structure based representation of uh, knowledge. Um, and, you know, uh, if you see semantically, the knowledge graph, 
uh, which we have been using in various type of search applications and um, holistic knowledge building and so on is semantically it's very much like the way LLMs are built and represented in memory. So uh, all the uh, neural networks are basically a knowledge graph, but they are in form of encoded networks. Uh, they don't have very one-to-one -one semantic meaning, but uh, uh, the way they operate are very much same. Um, for example, there is a company uh, called Altana. Uh, it's uh, one of the CTOs is uh, Peter Swarj. He's MIT PhD. I, I believe he's in East Coast. And what he was explaining me, they are using... Um, LLMs to perform the RLHF based technique on top of knowledge base. So you can do much more faster and efficient knowledge discovery, which can be uh, automated in a way. So I believe when you try to imagine the knowledge graph and try to compare with the neural networks, uh, you should still see them the similar uh, mechanism. Um, but um, Historically, they have been different domain because of their uh, timelines. But what I predict in very soon, almost all type of knowledge graph representations, because all knowledge graph representation are basically some sort of uh, either dense or sparse matrix representations of edges and vertices. Uh, but in future, what will happen? All types of knowledge graphs, they will be encoded into neural networks. So basically you will have some sort of representation in neural network. Actually, a lot of companies are already working in where you can um, encode whole knowledge graph as a neural network. And, and the inspiration, the way you use it sort of um, variational auto encoder as a compression mechanism, which they use. Um, and I believe in future, when you will say the term knowledge graph, nobody will imagine it's not a neural network. Almost every single type of knowledge graph will be encoded as a, a floating point um, uh, numbers in form of uh, neural networks. Uh, that's what I imagine. So I believe these technologies are at the point where they are being amalgamated. Uh, currently, they are being fused for the usage. But in future, what will happen? They will be fused and become uh, alter ego to each other to have a common representation for them. So I have, a, I have a view a little bit different than this. Uh, partly, I'm not looking so future looking, but I see enterprises all the time taking data. And I think there's still a lot of value in taking data and structuring it in a tabular way, right? Because you carve down to the essential data, the essential relationships, the variables, the things you care about. In the same way, like if you take the time to make a knowledge base and you put your customers and their orders and, you know, right, their friends and you graph all that stuff together and you can quickly then find relationships, find interactions like that in a way that maybe we'll be able to do that at some point inside a neural network or a large language model. But right now, there's still a lot of value to take the time to build that structure. Of course, it's a cost to kind of yeah. do that. But I don't think, you know, for lots of users that knowledge bases are going to go anywhere because of that. Yeah, that's right, Raju. I, I I totally agree. The cost of having the logistics of moving data from one modality to other modality is huge, especially at the word scale. Um, I think in future, when they see some sort of automated inspiration, for example, the company which I was talking about, I had the first question, why to reinvent the wheel? if you already have in the knowledge graph of whole thing. And they, they said, because a lot of things are still being done by humans and humans are in the loop. Uh, for example, in their supply chain product, they want to predict whether there is an unethical labor involved in whole supply chain at the global scale. And it is a very complex process to predict that, but they're seeing if the machines will be doing that, then probably nobody has to sit and babysit this whole process. Uh, so I believe only when there will be use cases, imagine people will take pain to do the logistics of moving from one domain to another uh, domain. Um, but I totally agree what you said. So we've talked a lot about uh, potential, you know, future of generative AI and, and all the benefits that uh, we can reap with this technology. But um, I'm curious about, uh, you know, what what you guys think are some of the current limitations of generative AI, um, and how can we address them? Uh, let's start with uh, Miriam, and then we'll head to uh, Christoph. Start on the very practical ones, and actually, like uh, Niels talked about this earlier, that language models are incredibly computation expensive. So um, you need incredibly big GPUs. The latency is really bad. 
there's a whole host of issues there. And I actually think um, Rajiv has talked about this before as well. Um, so anything we can do to compress, uh, do inference optimization is, is a fantastic thing. Um, that's on the practical side. Um, and, and that's the area that I, I really specialize in. But um, ethically, I still don't think we've quite figured out how to build really safe LLM systems. Um, and I think that's something that we'll see a lot of progress on in the next year or so as businesses really find those be best practices for, for building ethical and safe LLM applications. Yourself? Yeah, so interestingly, I have very two similar points. I think the computational aspect is definitely one of those, right? So um, really important in the future. Uh, I think regarding safety, I would say, you know, especially when it comes to having, we still have a lot of places where there's still a human in the loop, right? And I think that's going to continue for a little while. And I think it's continuing to build trust and, and to have something that is very reliable because while you know, if you have like an everyday sort of application and you're looking up like a recipe using ChatGPT, right? Like if your model hallucinates and so on, you know, right? Maybe you have like three eggs instead of two, right? In, in your cake. But if you're using an LLM to actually summarize the results of a clinical trial, right? It's a whole different kind of, you know, thing that you need to catch and the implications are more, much greater, right? So I think we need to uh, continue again, exploring and seeing and putting the proper guardrails in place so that this is all done in an ethical fashion and in a responsible way. So I think there is still work to do on that front. So the next question uh, will go first to uh, we'll go first to to Niels, then we'll go to uh, Sandeep and, and Christoph. And this is a question about uh, uh, industries. So I guess the question I really want to ask is what industries? should prepare for the widespread adoption of generative AI and how can they prepare for this? Uh, let's go to Niels, then we'll go to Sandeep and then Christoph. Yeah, maybe I don't have too much to say about what exact industries because I think it, it'll be pretty much everyone. Um, if that Maybe that's a little bit of a cop-out, but I, I think if you're dealing with any kind of data, it, it's like computers, right? Who, which like large scale or even small scale, medium scale company doesn't use a computer or digital systems. Um, but uh, yeah, I was talking to a friend who works at a media company and surprisingly, it, they're looking to use LLMs, but um, like surprisingly their data is still kind of siloed. It's still in various systems that don't talk to each other. There's not much interoperability. So I think in terms of preparing, it's the, unfortunately, the boring answer of like making those investments to perhaps modernize your data infrastructure, get your data house in order. Um, and it's not super shiny or super fancy, but once you're, once you're there, and, and maybe a few other things around labeling your data and making it ready for um, machine learning training and AI training, but I think in terms of preparation, it is is doing the thankless uh, kind of very uh, like kind of drudgery of getting your data in order. And I personally find that kind of exciting, but you know, it's it's not the thing you reach out for. The thing you reach out for is you have your data lake and you're just gonna try training an LLM on it and you know, Surprise, surprise, it doesn't do too well because your data is just not very clean. Classics never go out of style, right? Clean data <laughs> will never go out of style. Uh, let's go to Sandeep and then Christoph. Um, yeah, as uh, others are saying that I can't imagine an industry which will not be affected by this, of course. And of course, it's, it's a cliche statement. But what is the deeper meaning here is that no matter what you do, if if you are not using the advantages which AI brings to your job, somebody who is using those advantages will probably replace you. So it's not like doctors will become irrelevant or lawyers will become irrelevant, but definitely a lawyer which uses uh, AI-based assistance will replace an, uh, a lawyer which doesn't use the same. Um, so what I basically see every single industry where AI adoption will take place, which I imagine all of them, um, 
it's creating an opportunity in a way for example it's creating it's leveling the play playground so for example if you're uh, if you're a young doctor say you're a radiologist and you want to do some fundamental cutting edge research so ai can enable you to do that much faster than what historically people have been able to do for example if you work at harvard medical school and you want to do some fundamental research and you want to do, do that research in your extra time with already a busy schedule ai lets you do that so i would say ai is a opportunity maker tool in almost every single domain um, and uh, i imagine that sooner or later usage of ai will become like usage of microsoft word or microsoft excel everybody uses use in their day to day work to do things more efficiently and get better at whatever they are doing christoph let's uh, hear from you yeah so i'm going to stick with the cliche i also think that all industries will be impacted by this sooner or later and how to prepare uh, i would say again i think for me it's about trying it out and experimenting right because um it's again going very fast it's very transformative it's very hard you know for different industries sometimes to really really know now in this very you know fast paced environment like what what is it going to look like in 2 years and 3 years because of generative ai right so i think it's important to start experimenting because when you do that again you you learn about the tools you learn how to use them you see how you could you know evolve certain of your processes right how you could generate value maybe in a slightly different way how you can be more productive etc right and you can also surface some of those um limitations for example that Niels you mentioned right like if you have some gaps in your you know data management in your architecture right in your strategy then you can start surfacing this and actually doing something about it in a meaningful way because you know where you want to go right so i think again experimenting and bracing it and and seeing little by little how you know that can help you so I know we're running up on time here. So panelists, if anybody has to run, I totally understand. I know it's getting late for most of you. There is one last question coming in from the audience. I think it's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out. And if uh, anybody wants to jump in on it, just uh, feel free to, to go for it. And the question here is, could there be a saturation point where adding more knowledge won't make LLMs more intelligent? Would anybody like to take that on? Sandeep, I, I see you are unmuted when you when yeah. get shot, go for it. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, I would love to see that saturation point um, because I would love to see where we have already solved a lot of use cases which we can imagine we can do uh, with it. Um, but again, it, it's the same as humans as well because uh, humans only can be as useful as it is needed and same will happen with ai if ai has already saw a lot of uh, use cases and it's pre already pretty smart i think it will be the time where it will achieve the equilibrium of innovation uh, but i would love to be there there and we know as a matter of fact we are yet to reach there uh, we have problems like hallucinations and uh, democratizing and faster experimentation and all those uh, logistics involved. So I would love to see the saturation, but I think we are far from there. Rajiv, let's hear from you, then we'll go to uh, Niels. Yeah. Like if you look at the amount of data these models ingest now, where it's like trillions of tokens, like if you were opened a book and you read a book, it literally take you like 10,000 years to read the equivalent of a trillion tokens. And right, you have, I think the, the latest one by Mistral said something about 8 trillion tokens they started their trading data set with. So it's just a vast amount of information. And there's even so much more out there, other books, other YouTube videos like that. So I think we'll the, the amount of information in these models will continue to grow. Now, the question also said, will that make LLMs more intelligent? And I think intelligence is a whole big concept to unpack. And one of the big fundamental questions we see a debate about is how well can these models reason? How well can they plan? And we know that they can very much approximate it, make it look like they can because they're just predicting what they've seen in other stories. But I think one of the big open questions over the next couple of years is how much can they solve these complex reasoning tasks um, like that? And Niels, let's hear from you. Yeah, I think... As far as we can tell, um, obviously loss is not intelligence. Loss is 
a quantification of an objective function. But as far as we can tell, there, there is no saturation point based on, like, obviously, we are constrained by our hardware, constrained by our data. Um, I'm also very curious if, I mean, theoretically, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a saturation point. Um, but I think one of the questions this brings up is, like, what is the what is really the end game here? And I think for a lot of people in the field, is it's some kind of variably defined term AGI or super intelligence, right? Uh, I, I'm not really uh, in that camp per se. I'm more uh, on the team of humans and like helping us. And uh, my my pet theories around this is around symbiosis and my background is in biology. So that's, those are the metaphors I use. Um, but sorry if this is going a little bit off the rails, but I think, I think the, the question, the questions here can be reframed um, more in terms of how is this helping us as people, as society? Um, how are we as 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 we appear to be have this superpower of problem solving? Uh, other species problem solve as well, obviously, but like how are we going to uh, shape this technology um, going to the future? And that to me is less interest or the question of saturation and, and going super far in terms of like whatever goal we set of however we define intelligence is less important than the qualitative quality of life that we have kind of collectively. Thank you very much. Great question. Whoever asked that, there was an honest question. And on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, the panelists for joining. Thank you, Miriam, Sandeep, Christopher, Jeev, Niels. If you guys listening at home, uh, enjoyed this panel discussion. All the panelists will be presenting uh, at the Generative AI World Conference held in Austin, Texas from October 25th through October 26th. There's also a virtual component to this. Shout out to the organizers for sponsoring uh, this event and helping put it together. Again, that's the MLOps World Summit and the Generative AI World Summit. Uh, you can register for the conference with the discount code Harpreet to save $75 off your ticket price. Uh, I'm excited to check out your guys' talks. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. Thank you for joining in, uh, everybody in the audience. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. <laughs>